Hello, my name is Katie Foster and I'm a Senior Associate in the Corporate Finance Practice in London. I'm here today with Terence Fu, who is a corporate partner in our Beijing office. Today we're going to talk with Terence about one of the issues in the Chinese market where there's effectively a mismatch in the buyer's and the seller's expectation on price when doing M&A deals. Terence, can you talk to me a bit about why you're seeing such a mis mis mismatch in price expectations between buyers and sellers at the moment? I, I think it's it's mainly a, a fundamental um, difference in the approach that buyers and sellers uh, take to valuation in China. Um, Chinese sellers um, often take a less sophisticated approach to uh, valuation. For example, if you're dealing with Chinese entrepreneurs, uh, they would often look at the PE multiple of a uh, you know, listed comp uh, company comparable and, and view that that would be their, their expectation to price. Um, some other less sophisticated uh, Chinese sellers would would, would come up would would view uh, would take a net asset value um, uh, benchmark as as their basis for valuation. On the other hand, um, foreign buyers often uh, come to valuation with uh, with a discounted cash flow model, arriving at you know the enterprise value or um, looking at an EBITDA multiple, for example. And often that is the, the source of the mismatch. Okay, and what are people doing? What methods are people using in trying to bridge that gap? Um, one of the most common methods is uh, using some type of earnout structure. But if you're doing a deal in China, there are often uh, two, two common issues that arise when you use an earnout structure. Um, one is if the deal is structured so that it's, it's an onshore acquisition, so you're acquiring shares in a Chinese company, um, the Chinese M&A law would apply. And basically the rule there is that the purchase price has to be paid in full within one year. Mm -hmm. And often the earnout structure is often um, you know, over a period of time longer than one year. Uh, so you have to find a way to structure to get around that. Um, the second issue is uh, one of um, foreign exchange control. Um, because um, for the buyer to pay in foreign exchange to the seller, uh, the seller has to actually set up an account to receive foreign exchange. And the foreign exchange account is one that is granted by the foreign exchange regulator and it often has a cap or quota on the amount of foreign exchange that can come in. So when you have an earnout, it's effectively an increase in the purchase price and you would probably exceed the cap. So there are practical issues that arise as a result. Um, the, way to the common way to structure around that is to try to do a call option instead. So what, what, what you would do is to buy um, the majority of the shares that you want and leave a stub and um, once the earnout period is, is, uh, is, is over, um, then you exercise a call option to buy that stub of shares. Um, and that allows you to get around the one year rule because you're exercising the call option for a second acquisition. And it also allows you to get around the foreign exchange um, issue as well uh, because you're paying in, um, uh, it's not actually an, an increase in uh, or an adjustment to the original purchase price because it's actually a second acquisition. So these are quite complex um, structures. Do you find that um, or do you find that they commonly get executed? Um, it's it, because the pricing issue, the price valuation gap issue, is quite common in China, and this is one of the most um, commonly used um, structures. Excellent. Thank you very much, Terence.